Act One of Candida. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Candida, by George Bernard Shaw. Dramatis Personae. Proserpine Garnet, read by Elizabeth Clett. James Morell, read by Peter Bishop. Alexander Lexi Mill, read by Martin Geeson. Burgess, read by Algy Pug. Candida, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Eugene Marchbanks, read by M. B. Narrated by Elizabeth Clatt. Act One. A fine October morning in the northeast suburbs of London, a vast district many miles away from the London of Mayfair and St. James's, much less known there than the Paris of the Rue de Rivoli and the Champs Elysees, and much less narrow, squalid, fetid, and airless in its slums, strong and comfortable, prosperous middle-class life, wide streeted, myriad populated well served with ugly iron urinals, radical clubs, tram-lines, and a perpetual stream of yellow cars, enjoying in its main thoroughfares the luxury of grass-grown front gardens, untrodden by the foot of man, save as to the path from the gate to the hall door, but blighted by an intolerable monotony of miles and miles of graceless, characterless brick houses, black iron railings, stony pavements, slaty roofs, and respectably ill-dressed or disreputably poorly dressed people, quite accustomed to the place, and mostly plodding about somebody else's work, which they would not do if they themselves could help it. The little energy and eagerness that crop up show themselves in cockney cupidity and business push. Even the policemen and the chapels are not infrequent enough to break the monotony. The sun is shining cheerfully, there is no fog, and though the smoke effectually prevents anything, whether faces and hands or bricks and mortar, from looking fresh and clean, it is not hanging heavily enough to trouble a Londoner. This desert of unattractiveness has its oasis. Near the outer end of the Hackney Road is a park of two hundred and seventeen acres, fenced in, not by railings, but by a wooden paling, and containing plenty of greensward trees, a lake for bathers, flower-beds with the flowers arranged carefully in patterns by the admired cockney art of carpet-gardening and a sand-pit, imported from the seaside for the delight of the children but speedily deserted on its becoming a natural vermin preserve for all the petty fauna of Kingsland, Hackney, and Hoxton. A bandstand, and unfinished forum for religious, anti-religious, and political orators, cricket pitches, a gymnasium, and an old-fashioned stone kiosk are among its attractions. Wherever the prospect is bounded by trees or rising green grounds, it is a pleasant place. Where the ground stretches far to the grey palings, with bricks and mortar, sky-signs, crowded chimneys and smoke beyond, the prospect makes it desolate and sordid. The best view of Victoria Park is from the front window of St. Dominic's Parsonage, from which not a single chimney is visible. The Parsonage is a semi-detached villa with a front garden and a porch. Visitors go up the flight of steps to the porch. Tradespeople and members of the family go down by a door under the steps to the basement, with a breakfast-room, used for all meals in front, and the kitchen at the back. Upstairs, on the level of the hall door, is the drawing-room, with its large plate-glass window looking on the park. In this room, the only sitting-room that can be spared from the children and the family meals, the parson, the Reverend James Maver Morell, does his work. He is sitting in a strong, round-backed, revolving chair at the right-hand end of a long table, which stands across the window, so that he can cheer himself with the view of the park at his elbow. At the opposite end of the table, adjoining it, is a little table, only half the width of the other, with a typewriter on it. 
His typist is sitting at this machine, with her back to the window. The large table is littered with pamphlets, journals, letters, nests of drawers, an office diary, postage scales, and the like. A spare chair for visitors having business with the parson is in the middle, turned to his end. Within reach of his hand is a stationary case, and a cabinet photograph in a frame. Behind him the right-hand wall, recessed above the fireplace, is fitted with bookshelves, on which an adept eye can measure the parson's divinity and casuistry by a complete set of Browning's poems and Maurice's theological essays, and guess at his politics from a yellow-backed Progress and Poverty, Fabian Essays, A Dream of John Ball, Marx's Capital, and half a dozen other literary landmarks in socialism. Opposite him on the left, near the typewriter, is the door. Further down the room, opposite the fireplace, a bookcase stands on a cellaret with a sofa near it. There is a generous fire burning, and the hearth, with a comfortable armchair and a japanned flower-painted coal-scuttle at one side, a miniature chair for a boy or girl on the other, a nicely varnished wooden mantelpiece, with neatly moulded shelves, tiny bits of mirror let into the panels, and a travelling clock in a leather case, the inevitable wedding present and on the wall above a large autotype of the chief figure in Titian's Virgin of the Assumption, is very inviting. Altogether the room is the room of a good housekeeper, vanquished as far as the table is concerned by an untidy man, but elsewhere mistress of the situation. The furniture, in its ornamental aspect, betrays the style of the advertised drawing-room suite, of the pushing suburban furniture-dealer, but there is nothing useless or pretentious in the room. The paper and panelling are dark, throwing the big cheery window and the park outside into strong relief. The Rev. James Maver Morell is a Christian socialist clergyman of the Church of England, and an active member of the Guild of St. Matthew and the Christian Social Union. A vigorous, genial, popular man of forty, robust and good-looking, full of energy, with pleasant, hearty, considerate manners and a sound, unaffected voice, which he uses with the clean, athletic articulation of a practised orator, and with a wide range and perfect command of expression. He is a first-rate clergyman, able to say what he likes to whom he likes, to lecture people without setting himself up against them, to impose his authority on them without humiliating them, and to interfere in their business without impertinence. His wellspring of spiritual enthusiasm and sympathetic emotion has never run dry for a moment. He still eats and sleeps heartily enough to win the daily battle between exhaustion and recuperation triumphantly. Withal, a great baby, pardonably vain of his powers and unconsciously pleased with himself. He has a healthy complexion, a good forehead, with the brows somewhat blunt, and the eyes bright and eager a mouth resolute but not particularly well cut, and a substantial nose, with the mobile spreading nostrils of the dramatic orator, but like all his features, void of subtlety. The typist, Miss Proserpine Garnet, is a brisk little woman of about thirty, of the lower middle class, neatly but cheaply dressed in a black merino skirt and blouse, rather pert and quick of speech, and not very civil in her manner but sensitive and affectionate. She is clattering away busily at her machine, whilst Morel opens the last of his morning letters. He realises its contents with a comic groan of despair. Another lecture? Yes. The Hoxton Freedom Group want me to address them on Sunday morning. What are they? Mm, communist anarchists, I think. Just like anarchists not to know that they can't have a parson on Sunday. Tell them to come to church if they want to hear me. It will do them good. Say I can only come on Mondays and Thursdays. Have you the diary there? Yes. Have I any lecture on for next Monday? Tower Hamlet's Radical Club. Well, Thursday then. English Land Restoration League. What next? Guild of St. Matthew on Monday. Independent Labour Party, Greenwich Branch, on Thursday. Monday, Social Democratic Federation, Mile End Branch. Thursday, First Confirmation Class. 
Oh, I'd better tell them you can't come. There are only half a dozen ignorant and conceited costermongers without five shillings between them. Ha! <laughs> But you see, they're near relatives of mine, Miss Garnet. Relatives of yours? Yes, we have the same father in heaven. Oh, is that all? Ah, you don't believe it. Everybody says it. Nobody believes it. Nobody. Well, well, come, Miss Proserpine. Can't you find a date for the Costas? What about the twenty-fifth? That was vacant the day before yesterday. Engaged. The Fabian Society. Bother the Fabian Society. Is the twenty-eighth gone too? City dinner. You're invited to dine with the Founders Company. That'll do. I'll go to the Hoxton Group of Freedom instead. She enters the engagement in silence, with implacable disparagement of the Hoxton anarchists in every line of her face. Morel bursts open the cover of a copy of the Church Reformer, which has come by post, and glances through Mr. Stuart Hendlam's leader and the Guild of St. Matthew News. These proceedings are presently enlivened by the appearance of Morel's curate, the Reverend Alexander Mill, a young gentleman gathered by Morel from the nearest university settlement, whither he had come from Oxford to give the East End of London the benefit of his university training. He is a conceitedly well-intentioned, enthusiastic, immature person, with nothing positively unbearable about him except a habit of speaking with his lips carefully closed for half an inch from each corner, a finicking arthulation, and a set of horribly corrupt vowels, notably ow for o, this being his chief means of bringing Oxford refinement to bear on hackney vulgarity. Morel, whom he is won over by a dog-like devotion, looks up indulgently from the church reformer as he enters. Well, Lexy, late again as usual. I'm afraid so. I wish I could get up in the morning. Ha <laughs> ha! Watch and pray, Lexy. Watch and pray. I know, but how can I watch and pray when I am asleep? Isn't that so, Miss Prossy? Miss Garnet, if you please. I beg your pardon, Miss Garnet. You've got to do all the work today. Why? Never mind why. It'll do you good to earn your supper before you eat it for once in a way, as I do. Come, don't dawdle. You should have been off on your rounds half an hour ago. Is she in earnest, Morel? Yes, I am going to dawdle today. You, you don't know how. <laughs> don't I? I'm going to have this day all to myself, or at least the forenoon. My wife's coming back. She's due here at eleven forty-five. Coming back already with the children. I thought they were to stay to the end of the month. So they are. She's only coming up for two days to get some flannel things for Jimmy and to see how we're getting on without her. But my dear Morel, if what Jimmy and Fluffy had was scarlatina, do you think it wise? Scarlatina, rubbish. German measles. I bought it into the house myself from the Pycroft Street School. A parson is like a doctor, my boy. He must face infection as a soldier must face bullets. He rises and claps Lexy on the shoulder. Catch the measles if you can, Lexy. She'll nurse you, and what a piece of luck that will be for you, eh? It's so hard to understand you about Mrs. Morel. Ah. My boy, get married, get married to a good woman, and then you'll understand. That's a foretaste of what will be best in the kingdom of heaven we are trying to establish on earth. That will cure you of dawdling. An honest man feels that he must pay heaven for every hour of happiness with a good spell of hard, unselfish work to make others happy. We have no more right to consume happiness without producing it than to consume wealth without producing it. Get a wife like my Candida, and you'll always be in arrear with your repayment. He pats Lexy affectionately on the back and is leaving the room when Lexy calls to him. Oh, wait a bit! I forgot. Morel halts and turns with the doorknob in his hand. Your father-in-law is coming round to see you. 
Morel shuts the door again. Mr. Burgess? Yes, I passed him in the park, arguing with somebody. He gave me good day and asked me to let you know that he was coming. But he hasn't called here for, I may almost say for years. Are you sure, Lexi? You're not joking, are you? No, sir, really. Hmm. Time for him to take another look at Candida before she grows out of his knowledge. He resigns himself to the inevitable and goes out. Lexi looks after him with beaming, foolish worship. What a good man! What a thorough, loving soul he is! He takes Morel's place at the table, making himself very comfortable as he takes out a cigarette. Proserpine pulling the letter she has been working at off the typewriter and folding it. Oh, a man ought to be able to be fond of his wife without making a fool of himself about her. Oh, Miss Prossy! Proserpine rises busily and comes to the stationery case to get an envelope, in which she encloses the letter as she speaks. Candida here and Candida there and Candida everywhere. It's enough to drive anyone out of their senses. To hear a perfectly commonplace woman raved about in that absurd manner— "'Merely because she's got good hair and a tolerable figure. "'I think her extremely beautiful, Miss Garnet.' "'He takes the photograph up, looks at it, "'and adds with even greater impressiveness. Mm, "'Extremely beautiful! How fine her eyes are!' "'Her eyes are not a bit better than mine. Now!' "'He puts down the photograph and stares austerely at her. And you know very well that you think me dowdy and second-rate enough. Heaven forbid that I should think of any of God's creatures in such a way. Thank you. That's very nice and comforting. I had no idea you had any feeling against Mrs. Morell. I have no feeling against her. She's very nice, very good-hearted. I'm very fond of her. And can appreciate her real qualities far better than any man can. He shakes his head sadly and turns to the bookcase, looking along the shelves for a volume. She follows him with intense pepperiness. You don't believe me? You think I'm jealous. Oh, what a profound knowledge of the human heart you have, Mr. Lexy Mill. How well you know the weaknesses of woman, don't you? It must be so nice to be a man and have a fine, penetrating intellect instead of mere emotions like us, and to know that the reason we don't share your amorous delusions is that we're all jealous of one another. She abandons him with a toss of her shoulders, and crosses to the fire to warm her hands. Ah, if you women only had the same clue to man's strength that you have to his weakness, Miss Prossy— there would be no woman question. Where did you hear Morel say that? You didn't invent it yourself. You're not clever enough. That's quite true. I am not ashamed of owing him that, as I owe him so many other spiritual truths. He said it at the annual conference of the Women's Liberal Federation— Allow me to add that, though they didn't appreciate it, I, a mere man, did. Well, when you talk to me, give me your own ideas, such as they are, and not his. You never cut a poorer figure than when you were trying to imitate him. I try to follow his example, not to imitate him. Yes, you do. You imitate him. Why do you tuck your umbrella under your left arm instead of carrying it in your hand like anyone else? Why do you walk with your chin stuck out before you, hurrying along with that eager look in your eyes? You, who never get up before half-past nine in the morning. Why do you say knowledge in church, though you always say knowledge in private conversation? Bah! Do you think I don't know? Here, come and set about your work. We've wasted enough time for one morning. Here's a copy of the diary for today. Thank you. He takes it and stands at the table with his back to her, 
reading it. She begins to transcribe her shorthand notes on the typewriter, without troubling herself about his feelings. Mr. Burgess enters unannounced. He is a man of sixty, made coarse and sordid by the compulsory selfishness of petty commerce, and later on softened into sluggish bumptiousness by overfeeding and commercial success. A vulgar, ignorant, guzzling man, offensive and contemptuous to people whose labour is cheap, respectful to wealth and rank, and quite sincere and without rancour or envy in both attitudes. Finding him without talent, the world has offered him no decently paid work except ignoble work, and he has become in consequence somewhat hoggish. But he has no suspicion of this himself, and honestly regards his commercial prosperity as the inevitable and socially wholesome triumph of the ability, industry, shrewdness, and experience in business of a man who in private is easy-going, affectionate, and humorously convivial to a fault. Corporeally he is a podgy man, with a square, clean-shaven face and a square beard under his chin, dust-coloured, with a patch of grey in the centre, and small, watery blue eyes with a plaintively sentimental expression, which he transfers easily to his voice by his habit of pompously intoning his sentences. "'They told me Mr. Morell was here.' "'He's upstairs. I'll fetch him for you.' You're not the same young lady as used to typewrite for him? No. No. She was younger. Miss Garnet stolidly stares at him, then goes out with great dignity. He receives this quite obtusely, and crosses to the hearthrug, where he turns and spreads himself with his back to the fire. Start on your rounds, Mr. Mill. Yes, I must be off presently. Don't let me detain you, Mr. Mill. What I come about is private between me and Mr. Morell. Oh, I have no intention of intruding, I am sure, Mr. Burgess. Good morning. Oh, good morning to you. Morell returns as Lexy is making for the door. Off to work? Yes, sir. Take my silk handkerchief and wrap your throat up. There's a cold wind. Away with you. Lexy brightens up and goes out. Spoiling your curates as usual, James. Good morning. When I pay a man and his living depends on me, I keep him in his place. I always keep my curates in their places as my helpers and comrades. If you get as much work out of your clerks and warehousemen as I do out of my curates, you must be getting rich pretty fast. Will you take your old chair? He points with curt authority to the armchair beside the fireplace, then takes the spare chair from the table and sits down in front of Burgess. Just the same as ever, James? When you last called, it was about three years ago, I think, you said the same thing a little more frankly. Your exact words then were, Just as big a fool as ever, James. Well, perhaps I did, but I meant no offence by it. A clergyman is privileged to be a bit of a fool, you know. It's only becoming in his profession that he should. Anyhow, I come here, not to rake up whole differences, but to let bygones be bygones. James, three year ago, you done me a hill turn. You done me out of a contract, and when I give you harsh words, in my natural disappointment, you turn my daughter again me. Well, I've come to act the part of a Christian. I forgive you, James. Confound your impudence. Is that becoming language for a clergyman, James? And you so particular, too. No, sir. It is not becoming language for a clergyman. I use the wrong word. I should have said, damn your impudence. That's what St. Paul or any honest priest would have said to you. Do you think I have forgotten that tender of yours for the contract to supply clothing to the workhouse? I acted in the interests of ratepayers, James. It was the lowest tender. You can't deny that. Yes, the lowest, because you paid worse wages than any other employer. Starvation wages, 
I, worse than starvation wages to the women who made the clothing. Your wages would have driven them to the streets to keep body and soul together. Those women were my parishioners. I shamed the guardians out of accepting your tender. I shamed the ratepayers out of letting them do it. I shamed everybody but you. How dare you, sir, come here and offer to forgive me and talk about your daughter and... Easy, James, easy, easy. Don't get into a fluster about nothing. I've honed I was wrong. Have you? I didn't hear you. Of course I did. I hone it now. Come, I ask your pardon for the letter I wrote you. Is that enough? That's nothing. Have you raised the wages? Yes. What? I've turned a model employer. I don't employ no women now. They're all sacked, and the work is done by machinery. Not a man as less than sixpence an hour. And the skilled hands gets the trade union rate. What have you to say to me now? Is it possible? Well, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. My dear Burgess, I most heartily beg your pardon for my hard thoughts of you. And now, don't you feel the better for the change? Come, confess, you're happier. You look happier. Well, perhaps I do. I suppose I must, since you notice it. At all events, I get my contracts accepted by a county council. They does not have nothing to do with me unless I pay fair wages. Curse a for a parcel of meddling fools. So that was why you raised the wages. Why else should I do it? What does it lead to but drink and huppishness in work and men? It's all very well for you, James. It gets you into the papers and makes a great man of you. But you never think of the arm you do, putting money into the pockets of work and men that they don't know how to spend, and taking it from people that might be making a good use on it. What is your business with me this morning? I shall not pretend to believe that you are here merely out of family sentiment. Yes, I am. Just family sentiment and nothing else. I don't believe you. Don't say that to me again, James Maver Morrell. I'll say it just as often as may be necessary to convince you that it's true. I don't believe you. Oh, well, if you're determined to be unfriendly, I suppose I'd better go. He moves reluctantly towards the door. Morell makes no sign. He lingers. I didn't expect to find an unforgiven spirit in you, James. Morell, still not responding, he takes a few more reluctant steps doorwards. Then he comes back, whining. We used to get on well enough, in spite of our different opinions. Why are you so changed to me? I give you my word... I come here in pure friendliness, not wishing to be on bad terms with my own daughter's husband. Come, James, be a Christian and shake hands. He puts his hand sentimentally on Morel's shoulder. Look here, Burgess, do you want to be as welcome here as you were before you lost that contract? I do, James, I do, honest. Then why don't you behave as you did then? How do you mean? I'll tell you. You thought me a young fool then? No, I didn't, James. I... Yes, you did. And I thought you an old scoundrel. No, you didn't, James. Now you do yourself an injustice. Yes, I did. Well, that did not prevent our getting on very well together. God made you what I call a scoundrel, and he made me what you call a fool. The effect of this observation on Burgess is to remove the keystone of his moral arch. He becomes bodily weak, and with his eyes fixed on Morel in a helpless stare, puts out his hand apprehensively to balance himself, as if the floor had suddenly sloped under him. It was not for me to quarrel with his handiwork in the one case more than in the other. So long as you come here, honestly, as a self-respecting, thorough, convinced scoundrel, justifying your scoundrelism and proud of it, you are welcome. But... 
I won't have you here snivelling about being a model employer and a converted man when you're only an apostate with your coat turned for the sake of a county council contract. He nods at him to enforce the point, then goes to the hearthrug, where he takes up a comfortably commanding position with his back to the fire and continues. No, I like a man to be true to himself, even in wickedness. Come now, either take your hat and go, or else sit down and give me a good scoundrelly reason for wanting to be friends with me. Burgess, whose emotions have subsided sufficiently to be expressed by a dazed grin, is relieved by this concrete proposition. He ponders it for a moment, and then, slowly and very modestly, sits down in the chair Morell has just left. That's right. Now, out with it. Well, you are a queer bird, James, and no mistake. But one can't help liking you. Besides, as I said afore, of course one don't take all a clergyman says seriously, or the world couldn't go on, could it now? Well, I don't mind telling you, since it's your wish we should be free with one another, that I did think you a bit of a fool once, but I'm beginning to think that perhaps I was behind the times a bit. Aha! You're finding that out at last, are you? Yes, times has changed more than I could have believed. Five year ago, no sensible man would have thought of taken up with your ideas. I used to wonder you was let preach at all. Why, I know a clergyman that has been kept out of his job for years by the Bishop of London, although the poor fellow's not a bit more religious than you are. But today, if anyone was offered to bet me a thousand pound that you'll end up being a bishop yourself, I shouldn't venture to take the bet. You and your crew are getting influential. I can see that. They'll have to give you something some day, even if it's only to stop your mouth. You had the right instant art of all, James. The line you took is the paid line in the long run for a man of your sort. Shake hands, Burgess. Now you're talking honestly. I don't think they'll make me a bishop, but if they do, I'll introduce you to the biggest jobbers I can get to come to my dinner parties. You will have your joke, James. Our quarrel's made up now, isn't it? Say yes, James. Startled, they turn quickly, and find that Candida has just come in, and is looking at them with an amused maternal indulgence, which is her characteristic expression. She is a woman of thirty-three, well-built, well-nourished, likely, one guesses, to become matronly later on, but now quite at her best, with the double charm of youth and motherhood. Her ways are those of a woman who has found that she can always manage people by engaging their affection, and who does so frankly and instinctively without the smallest scruple. So far she is like any other pretty woman who is just clever enough to make the most of her sexual attractions for trivially selfish ends. But Candida's serene brow, courageous eyes, and well-set mouth and chin signify largeness of mind and dignity of character to ennoble her cunning in the affections. A wise-hearted observer, looking at her, would at once guess that whoever had placed the Virgin of the Assumption over her hearth did so because he fancied some spiritual resemblance between them, and yet would not suspect either her husband or herself of any such idea, or indeed of any concern with the art of Titian. Just now she is in bonnet and mantle, laden with a strapped rug with her umbrella stuck through it, a handbag, and a supply of illustrated papers. Candida! Why! My darling! Hurrying to her and seizing the rug strap. I intended to meet you at the train. I let the time slip. I was so engrossed by... I forgot. Oh! He embraces her with penitent emotion. How awes you, Candy? She, still in Morell's arms, offers him her cheek, which he kisses. James as me is come to an understanding, an honourable understanding. Ain't we, James? Oh, bother your understanding. You've kept me late for Candida. My poor love, how did you manage about the luggage? How— 
There, 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 I wasn't alone. Eugene came down yesterday, and we travelled up together. Eugene? Yes, he's struggling with my luggage, poor boy. Go out, dear, at once, or he will pay for the cab, and I don't want that. Morel hurries out. Candida puts down her handbag, then takes off her mantle and bonnet, and puts them on the sofa with the rug, chatting meanwhile. Well, Papa, how are you getting on at home? The house ain't worth living in since you left it, Candy. I wish you'd come around and give a girl a talk on to. Who's this Eugene that's come with you? Oh, Eugene's one of James's discoveries. He found him sleeping on the embankment last June. Haven't you noticed our new picture? He gave us that. Go on. Do you mean to tell me, your home father, that cab touts or such like, off the embankment, buys pictures like that? Don't deceive me, Candy. It's a high church picture, and James chose it himself. Guess again. Eugene isn't a cab tout. In what is he a nobleman, I suppose? Yes, his uncle's up here, a real live earl. No. Yes, he had a seven-day bill for fifty-five pounds in his pocket when James found him on the embankment. He thought he couldn't get any money for it until the seven days were up, and he was too shy to ask for credit. Oh, he's a dear boy. We are very fond of him. Hmm. I thought you wouldn't get a Pure's nevy visitin' in Victoria Park, unless you were a bit of a flat. Of course, I don't owe with that picture, Candy, but still, it's a high-class, fust-rate work of art. I could see that. Be sure you introduce him to me, Candy. I can only stay about two minutes. Morel comes back with Eugene, whom Burgess contemplates moist-eyed with enthusiasm. He is a strange, shy youth of eighteen, slight, effeminate, with a delicate, childish voice, and a hunted, tormented expression and shrinking manner that show the painful sensitiveness that very swift and acute apprehensiveness produces in youth, before the character has grown to its full strength. Yet everything that his timidity and frailty suggests is contradicted by his face. He is miserably irresolute, does not know where to stand or what to do with his hands and feet, is afraid of Burgess, and would run away into solitude if he dared. But the very intensity with which he feels a perfectly commonplace position shows great nervous force, and his nostrils and mouth show a fiercely petulant willfulness, as to the quality of which his great imaginative eyes and fine brow are reassuring. He is so entirely uncommon as to be almost unearthly, and to prosaic people there is something noxious in this unearthliness, just as to poetic people there is something angelic in it. His dress is anarchic. He wears an old blue serge jacket, unbuttoned over a woolen lawn tennis shirt, with a silk handkerchief for a cravat, trousers matching the jacket, and brown canvas shoes. In these garments he has apparently lain in the heather and waded through the waters, but there is no evidence of his ever having brushed them. As he catches sight of a stranger on entering, he stops, and edges along the wall on the opposite side of the room. "'Come along. You can spare us a quarter of an hour at all events. This is my father-in-law, Mr. Burgess. Mr. Marchbanks. "'Glad to meet you, sir.' "'Glad to meet you, I'm sure, Mr. Marchbanks.' Forcing him to shake hands. "'How do you find yourself this weather?' Hope you ain't letting James put no foolish ideas into your head. Foolish ideas? Oh, oh, you mean socialism. Oh, no. That's right. Well, I must go now. There's no help for it. You're not coming my way, are you, Mr. Marchbanks? Uh, which way is that? Victoria Pork Station. There's a city train at 12.25. Nonsense. Eugene will stay to lunch with us, I expect. Uh, no, I... I... Well, well, I shan't press you. I bet you'd rather lunch with Candy. Some night, I hope, you'll come and dine with me at my club, the Freeman Founders in Norton Folgate. Come, 
so you will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, where is Norton Fulgate? Uh, down in Surrey, isn't it? You'll lose your train, Papa, if you don't go at once. Come back in the afternoon and tell Mr. Marchbanks where to find the club. Down in Surrey. Ha, oh, ha, oh, that's not a bad one. Well, I never met a man as didn't know Norton Folgert before. Good-bye, Mr. Marchbanks. I know you're too high-bred to take my pleasantry in bad part. He again offers his hand. Marchbanks takes it with a nervous jerk. Not at all. Bye-bye, Candy. I'll look in again later on. So long, James. Must you go? Don't stir. He goes out with unabated heartiness. Oh, I'll see you out. He follows him out. Eugene stares after them apprehensively, holding his breath until Burgess disappears. Well, Eugene. He turns with a start and comes eagerly towards her, but stops irresolutely as he meets her amused look. What do you think of my father? Uh, I, I hardly know him yet. He seems to be a very nice old gentleman. And you'll go to the Freeman founders to dine with him, won't you? Yes, if it will please you. Do you know you are a very nice boy, Eugene, with all your queerness? If you had laughed at my father, I shouldn't have minded. But I like you ever so much better for being nice to him. Ought I to have laughed? I noticed that he said something funny, but... I am so ill at ease with strangers, and I never can see a joke. I'm very sorry. He sits down on the sofa, his elbows on his knees and his temples between his fists, with an expression of hopeless suffering. Oh, come, you great baby, you. You are worse than usual this morning. Why were you so melancholy as we came along in the cab? Oh, that was nothing. I was wondering how much I ought to give the cabman. I know, it's utterly silly, but you don't know how dreadful such things are to me, how I shrink from having to deal with strange people. But it's all right. He beamed all over and touched his hat when Morel gave him two shillings. I was on the point of offering him ten. Morel comes back with a few letters and newspapers which have come by the midday post. Oh, James, dear, he was going to give the cabman ten shillings. Ten shillings for a three minutes drive. Oh, dear. Never mind her, Marchbanks. The overpaying instinct is a generous one, better than the underpaying instinct, and not so common. No, cowardice. Incompetence. Mrs. Morell's quite right. Of course she is. She takes up her handbag. And now I must leave you to James for the present. I suppose you are too much of a poet to know the state a woman finds her house in when she's been away for three weeks. Give me my rug. Eugene takes the strapped rug from the couch and gives it to her. She takes it in her left hand, having the bag in her right. Now hang my cloak across my arm. He obeys. Now my hat. He puts it into the hand which has the bag. Now open the door for me. He hurries up before her and opens the door. Thanks. She goes out, and Marchbanks shuts the door. You'll stay for lunch, Marchbanks, of course? I, I mustn't. I, I can't. You mean you won't? No, I, I should like to, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, but, uh, but... But, 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 bosh. If you'd like to stay, stay. You don't mean to persuade me you have anything else to do. If you're shy, go and take a turn in the park and write poetry until half-past one, and then come in and have a good feed. Thank you, I should like that very much, but I really mustn't. The truth is, Mrs. Morell told me not to. She said she didn't think you'd ask me to stay to lunch, but that I was to remember, if you did, that you didn't really want me to. She said I'd understand, but I don't. Please, don't tell her I told you. Oh, is that all? Won't my suggestion that you should take a turn in the park meet the difficulty? How? Why, you duffer. No, I won't put it in that way. My dear lad, in a happy marriage like ours, there is something very sacred in the return of the wife to her home. 
An old friend or a truly noble and sympathetic soul is not in the way on such occasions, but a chance visitor is. The hunted, horror-stricken expression comes out with sudden vividness in Eugene's face as he understands. Morel, occupied with his own thought, goes on without noticing it. Candida thought I would rather not have you here. But she was wrong. I am very fond of you, my boy, and I should like you to see for yourself what a happy thing it is to be married as I am. Happy? You're married? You think that? You, you believe that? I know it, my lad. La Rouchebocalde said that there are convenient marriages, but no delightful ones. You don't know the comfort of seeing through and through a thundering liar and rotten cynic like that fellow. Ha <laughs> ha! Now off with you to the park and write your poem. Half past one, sharp mind. We never wait for anybody. No, stop! You shot! I'll force it into the light. Eh? Force what? I must speak to you. There is something that must be settled between us. Now? Now, before you leave this room. He retreats a few steps and stands as if to bar Morel's way to the door. I'm not going to leave it, my dear boy. I thought you were. Eugene, baffled by his firm tone, turns his back on him, writhing with anger. Morel goes to him and puts his hand on his shoulder, strongly and kindly, disregarding his attempt to shake it off. Come, sit down quietly and tell me what it is, and remember we are friends, and need not fear that either of us will be anything but patient and kind to the other. Whatever we may have to say. Oh, I'm not forgetting myself. I'm only full of horror. You shall see whether this is a time for patience and kindness. Don't look at me in that self-complacent way. You think yourself stronger than I am. But I shall stagger you if you have a heart in your breast. Stagger me, my boy. Out with it. First... First, I love your wife. <laughs> Why, my dear child, of course you do. Everybody loves her. They can't help it. I like it. But, I say, Eugene, do you think yours is a case to be talked about? You're under twenty. She's over thirty. Doesn't it look rather too like a case of calf love? You dare say that, Arthur? You think that way of the love she inspires? It, it is an insult to her. To her, Eugene? Take care. I have been patient. I hope to remain patient. But there are some things I won't allow. Don't force me to show you the indulgence I should show a child. Be a man. Oh, let us put aside all that cant. It horrifies me when I think of the doses of it she has had to endure in all the weary years during which you have selfishly and blindly sacrificed her to minister to your self-sufficiency. You, who have not one thought, one sense in common with her. She seems to bear it pretty well. Eugene, my boy, you are making a fool of yourself, a very great fool of yourself. There's a piece of wholesome plain speaking for you. How do you think I don't know all that? Do you think that the things people make fools of themselves about are any less real and true than the things they behave sensibly about? They are more true. They are the only things that are true. You are very calm and sensible and moderate with me because you can see that I am a fool about your wife. Just as, no doubt, that old man who is here just now is very wise over your socialism because he sees that you are a fool about it. Does that prove you wrong? Does your complacent superiority to me prove that I am wrong? Marchbanks, some devil is putting these words into your mouth. It is easy, terribly easy, to shake a man's faith in himself. To take advantage of that to break a man's spirit is devil's work. Take care of what you are doing. Take care. I know. I'm doing it on purpose. I told you I should stagger you. They confront one another threateningly for a moment. Then Morel recovers his dignity. Eugene, listen to me. Some day I hope and trust you will be a happy man like me. You will be married, and you will be working with 
all your might and valour to make every spot on earth as happy as your own home. You will be one of the makers of the kingdom of heaven on earth, and, who knows, you may be a pioneer and master builder where I am only a humble journeyman. For don't think, my boy, that I cannot see in you, young as you are, promise of higher powers than I can ever pretend to. I well know that it is in the poet that the Holy Spirit of man, the God within him, is most godlike. It should make you tremble to think of that, to think that the heavy burden and great gift of a poet may be laid upon you. It does not make me tremble. It is the want of it in others that makes me tremble. Then help to kindle it in them, in me, not to extinguish it. In the future, when you are as happy as I am, I will be your true brother in the faith. I will help you to believe that God has given us a world that nothing but our own folly keeps from being a paradise. I will help you to believe that every stroke of your work is sowing happiness for the great harvest that all, even the humblest, shall one day reap. And last, but trust me, not least, I will help you to believe that your wife loves you and is happy in her home. We need such help, Marchbanks. We need it greatly and always. There are so many things to make us doubt, if once we let our understanding be troubled. Even at home we sit as if in camp, encompassed by a hostile army of doubts. Will you play the traitor and let them in on me? Is it like this for her here always? A woman with a great soul, craving for reality, truth, freedom, and being fed on metaphors, sermons, stale perorations, mere rhetoric. Do you think a woman's soul can live on your talent for preaching? Marchbanks, you make it hard for me to control myself. My talent is like yours, in so far as it has any real worth at all. It is the gift of finding words for divine truth. It's the gift of the gab, nothing more and nothing less. What has your knack of fine talking to do with the truth any more than playing the organ has? I've never been in your church, but I've been to your political meetings, and I've seen you do what's called rousing the meeting to enthusiasm. That is, you excited them till they behaved exactly as if they were drunk, and their wives looked on and saw clearly enough what fools they were. Oh, it's an old story. You'll find it in the Bible. I imagine King David, in his fits of enthusiasm, was very like you. But his wife despised him in her heart. Leave my house, do you hear? He advances on him threateningly. Marchbanks, shrinking back against the couch. Let me alone! Don't touch me! Morel grasps him powerfully by the lapel of his coat. He cowers down on the sofa. Stop, Morel! If you strike me, I'll kill myself! I won't bear it! Let me go! Take your hand away! You little, snivelling, cowardly whelp! Releasing him. Go, before you frighten yourself into a fit! I'm not afraid of you. It's you who are afraid of me! It looks like it, doesn't it? Yes, it does! Morel turns away contemptuously. Eugene scrambles to his feet and follows him. You think because I shrink away from being brutally handled? Because I can do nothing but cry with rage when I am met with violence? Because I can't lift a heavy trunk down from the top of a cab like you? Because I can't fight for your wife as a navvy would? All that makes you think that I'm afraid of you, where you're wrong! If I haven't got what you call British pluck, I haven't British cowardice either. I'm not afraid of a clergyman's ideas. I'll fight your ideas. I'll rescue her from her slavery to them. I'll pit my ideas against them. You are driving me out of the house because you daren't let her choose between your ideas and mine. You are afraid to let me see her again. Morel, angered, turns suddenly on him. He flies to the door in involuntary dread. Let me alone, I say. I'm going. Wait a moment. I am not going to touch you. Don't be afraid. When my wife comes back, she will want to know why you have gone. And when she finds that you are never going to cross our threshold again, she will want to have that explained too. Now, I don't wish to distress her by telling her that you have behaved like a blackguard. You shall. You must. 
If you give any explanation but the true one, you are a liar and a coward. Tell her what I said, and how you were strong and manly and shook me as a terrier shakes a rat, and how I shrank and was terrified, and how you called me a sniveling little whelp and put me out of the house. If you don't tell her, I will. I'll, I'll write to her. Why do you want her to know this? Because she will understand me and know that I understand her. If you keep back one word of it from her, if you are not ready to lay the truth at her feet as I am, then you will know to the end of your days that she really belongs to me and not to you. Goodbye. Stop. I will not tell her. Either the truth or a lie. You must tell her if I go. Marchbanks, it is sometimes justifiable. I know, to lie. It will be useless. Goodbye, Mr. Clergyman. As he turns finally to the door, it opens, and Candida enters in housekeeping attire. Are you going, Eugene? Well, dear me, just look at you going out into the street in that state. You are a poet, certainly. Look at him, James. She takes him by the coat and brings him forward to show to Morel. Look at his collar. Look at his tie. Look at his hair. One would think somebody had been throttling you. Here, stand still. She buttons his collar, ties his neckerchief in a bow, and arranges his hair. There. Now you look so nice that I think you'd better stay to lunch after all, although I told you you mustn't. It will be ready in half an hour. She puts a final touch to the bow. He kisses her hand. Don't be silly. I want to stay, of course. Uh, unless the reverend gentleman, your husband, has anything to advance to the contrary. Shall he stay, James, if he promises to be a good boy and to help me to lay the table? Marchbanks turns his head and looks steadfastly at Morel over his shoulder, challenging his answer. Oh, yes, certainly. He had better. He goes to the table and pretends to busy himself with his papers there. Marchbanks offering his arm to Candida. Come and lay the table. She takes it, and they go to the door together. I am the happiest of men. So was I. An hour ago. End of Act One Act Two of Candida this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Candida by George Bernard Shaw Act Two The same day, the same room, late in the afternoon. The spare chair for visitors has been replaced at the table, which is, if possible, more untidy than before. Marchbanks, alone and idle, is trying to find out how the typewriter works— Hearing someone at the door, he steals guiltily away to the window and pretends to be absorbed in the view. Miss Garnet, carrying the notebook in which she takes down Morel's letters in shorthand from his dictation, sits down at the typewriter and sets to work transcribing them, much too busy to notice Eugene. Unfortunately, the first key she strikes sticks. "'Bother! You've been meddling with my typewriter, Mr. Marchbanks.' And there's not the least use in your trying to look as if you hadn't. I'm very sorry, Miss Garnet. I only tried to make it right. Well, you've made this key stick. I assure you, I didn't touch the keys. I, I didn't, indeed. I only turned a little wheel. Oh, now I understand. I suppose you thought it was a sort of barrel organ. Nothing to do but turn the handle... And it would write a beautiful love letter for you straight off, eh? I suppose a machine could be made to write love letters. They're all the same, aren't they? How do I know? Why do you ask me? Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought clever people, people who can do business and write letters and that sort of thing, always had love affairs. Mr. Marchbanks. I hope I haven't offended you. Perhaps I shouldn't have alluded to your love affairs. I haven't any love affairs. How dare you say such a thing? Really? Oh, then you're shy, like me. Isn't that so? Certainly I am not shy. What do you mean? You must be. 
That is the reason there are so few love affairs in the world. We all go about longing for love. It is the first need of our natures, the loudest cry of our hearts, but we dare not utter our longing. We are too shy. Oh, Miss Garnet, what would you not give to be without fear, without shame? Well, upon my word. Ah, oh, don't say those stupid things to me. They don't deceive me. What use are they? Why are you afraid to be your real self with me? I'm just like you. Like me? Pray, are you flattering me or flattering yourself? I don't feel quite sure which. Hush. I go about in search of love, and I find it in unmeasured stores in the bosoms of others. But when I try to ask for it, this horrible shyness strangles me, and I stand dumb, or worse than dumb, saying meaningless things, foolish lies, and I see the affection I am longing for given to dogs and cats and pet birds, because they come and ask for it. It must be asked for. It is like a ghost. It cannot speak unless it is first spoken to. All the love in the world is longing to speak, only it dare not, because it is shy, shy, shy. That is the world's tragedy. <sighs> Wicked people get over that shyness occasionally, don't they? Wicked people means people who have no love. Therefore they have no shame. They have the power to ask love because they don't need it. They have the power to offer it because they have none to give. But we who have love and long to mingle it with the love of others, we cannot utter a word. You find that, don't you? Look here, if you don't stop talking like this, I'll leave the room, Mr. Marchbanks. I really will. It's not proper. Nothing that's worth saying is proper. I don't understand you, Miss Garnet. What am I to talk about? Talk about indifferent things. Talk about the weather. Would you stand and talk about indifferent things if a child were by, crying bitterly with hunger? I suppose not. Well, I can't talk about indifferent things with my heart crying out bitterly in its hunger. Then hold your tongue. <laughs> yes, that is what it always comes to. We hold our tongues. Does that stop the cry of your heart? For it does cry, doesn't it? It must if you have a heart. Oh, it's no use trying to work while you talk like that. She leaves her little table and sits on the sofa. Her feelings are evidently strongly worked on. It's no business of yours whether my heart cries or not. But I have a mind to tell you for all that. You needn't. I already know that it must. But mind, if you ever say I said so, I'll deny it. Yes, I know. And so you haven't the courage to tell him. Him? Who? Whoever he is, the man you love, it might be anybody. The curate, Mr. Mill, perhaps. Mr. Mill? A fine man to break my heart about, indeed. I'd rather have you than Mr. Mill. Uh, no, no, really, I'm very sorry, but you mustn't think of that. I... Oh, don't be frightened. It's not you. It's not any one particular person. I know. You feel that you could love anybody that offered. Anybody that offered? No, I do not. What do you take me for? Oh, no use. You won't make me real answers. Only those things that everybody says. He strays to the sofa and sits down disconsolately. Oh, well, if you want original conversation, you'd better go and talk to yourself. That is what all poets do. They talk to themselves out loud, and the world overhears them. But it's horribly lonely not to hear someone else talk sometimes. Wait until Mr. Morell comes. He'll talk to you. Oh, you needn't make wry faces over him. He can talk better than you. He'd talk your little head off. She is going back angrily to her place, when suddenly enlightened he springs up and stops her. Ah! I understand now. What do you understand? Your secret. Tell me. Is it really and truly possible for a woman to love him? Well. No, answer me. I want to know. I must know. I can't understand it. I can see nothing in him but words, pious resolutions, what people call goodness. 
It can't love that. I simply don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand you. You do. You lie. Oh. You do understand and you know. Is it possible for a woman to love him? Yes. He covers his face with his hands. Whatever is the matter with you? He takes down his hands and looks at her. Frightened at the tragic mask presented to her, she hurries past him at the utmost possible distance, keeping her eyes on his face until he turns from her and goes to the child's chair beside the hearth, where he sits in the deepest dejection. As she approaches the door, it opens and Burgess enters. Praise heaven, here's somebody! And sits down reassured at her table. She puts a fresh sheet of paper into the typewriter as Burgess crosses to Eugene. Well, so this is the way they leave you to yourself, Mr. Mortchbanks. I've come to keep you company. James is receiving a deputation in the dining room, and Candy is upstairs educating of a young stitcher girl she's interested in. She's sitting there learning her to read out of the heavenly twins. You must find it lonesome here with no one but the typist to talk to. He pulls round the easy chair above fire and sits down. He'll be all right now that he has the advantage of your polished conversation. That's one comfort anyhow. She begins to typewrite with clattering asperity. I was not addressing myself to you, young woman, that I'm aware of. Did you ever see worse manners, Mr. Marchbanks? Mr. Marchbanks is a gentleman and knows his place, which is more than some people do. It's well you and I are not ladies and gentlemen. I'd talk to you pretty straight if Mr. Marchbanks wasn't here. She pulls the letter out of the machine so crossly that it tears. Ah, oh, there, now I've spoiled this letter. Have to be done all over again. Oh, I can't contain myself. Silly old fathead. Ho! I'm a silly old fathead, am I? Ho! <laughs> Indeed! All right, my girl. All right. You just wait till I tell that to your employer. You'll see. I'll teach you. See, I don't. I... No, you've done it now. No use of talking to me. I'll let you know who I am. Proserpine shifts her paper carriage with a defiant bang, and disdainfully goes on with her work. Don't you take no notice of her, Mr. Morchbanks. She's beneath it. Uh, hadn't we better change the subject? I, I, I don't think Miss Garnet meant anything. Oh, didn't I, though? Just? I wouldn't demean myself to take notice on her. An electric bell rings twice. That's for me. She hurries out. Well, we can spare you. Now we're alone, Mr. Morchbanks. Let me give you a friendly hint, though I wouldn't give to everybody. How long have you known my son-in-law James here? I, I don't know. I never can remember dates. A few months, perhaps. Ever notice anything queer about him? I, I don't think so. No more you wouldn't. That's the danger in it. Well, he's mad. Mad? Mad as a mort heir. You take notice on him, and you'll see. But surely that is only because his opinions... That's what I used to think, Mr. Morchbanks. I thought long enough that it was only his opinions, though. Mind you, opinions becomes a very serious things when people takes to hecty on em as he does. But that's not what I go on. He looks round to make sure that they are alone, and bends over to Eugene's ear. What do you think he says to me this morning in this very room? What? He says to me, this is as sure as we're sitting here now, he says, I'm a fool, he says, and you're a scoundrel, as cool as possible. Me a scoundrel, mind you and then shook hands with me on it, as if it was to my credit. Do you mean to tell me that that man's sane? Morel outside, calling to Proserpine, holding the door open. 
Get all their names and addresses, Miss Garnet. Yes, Mr. Morell. Morell comes in with the deputation's documents in his hands. You're he is. Just you keep your eye on him and see. I'm sorry, James, to have to make a complaint to you. I don't want to do it, but I feel I ought to as a matter of right and duty. What's the matter? Mr. Marchbanks will bear me out. He was a witness. Your young woman had so far forgot herself as to call me a silly old fat-head. Oh, now, isn't that exactly like Prossy? She's so frank, she can't contain herself. Poor Prossy. <laughs> and you expect me to put up with it from the like of her? Uh? Pooh, nonsense. You can't take any notice of it. Never mind. Oh, I don't mind. I'm above it. But is it right? That's what I want to know. Is it right? That's a question for the church, not for the laity. Has it done you any harm? That's the question for you, eh? Of course it hasn't. Think no more of it. He dismisses the subject by going to his place at the table and setting to work at his correspondence. What did I tell you? Mad as a air. When's dinner, James? Not for half an hour yet. Give me a nice book to read over the fire, will you, James? There's a good chap. What sort of book? A good one? No. Somewhat pleasant, just to pass the time. Morell takes an illustrated paper from the table and offers it. He accepts it humbly. Thank you, James. He goes back to his easy chair at the fire and sits there at his ease, reading. Candida will come to entertain you presently. She has got rid of her pupil. She is filling the lamps. But that will soil her hands. I can't bear that, Morel. It's a shame. I'll go and fill them. He makes for the door. You'd better not. Marchbank stops irresolutely. She'd only set you to clean my boots to save me the trouble of doing it myself in the morning. Don't you keep a servant now, James? Yes, but she isn't a slave, and the house looks as if I kept three. That means that everyone has to lend a hand. It's not a bad plan. Prossy and I can talk business after breakfast whilst we're washing up. Washing up's no trouble when there are two people to do it. Do you think every woman is as coarse-grained as Miss Garnet? That's quite right, Mr. Marchbanks. That's quite right. She is coarse-grained. Marchbanks. Yes? How many servants does your father keep? Oh, I don't know. He comes back uneasily to the sofa, as if to get as far as possible from Morel's questioning, and sits down in a great agony of mind, thinking of the paraffin. So many that you don't know. Anyhow, when there's anything coarse grain to be done, you ring the bell and throw it on to somebody else, eh? That's one of the great facts in your existence, isn't it? Oh, don't torture me. The one great fact now is that your wife's beautiful fingers are dabbling in paraffin oil and that you are sitting here comfortably preaching about it. Everlasting preaching, preaching, words, words, words. Ha, <laughs> ha, devil a bitter. How'd you there, James? Straight? Candida comes in, well-aproned, with a reading lamp, trimmed, filled, and ready for lighting. She places it on the table near Morel, ready for use. If you stay with us, Eugene, I think I will hand over the lamps to you. I will stay, on condition that you hand over all the rough work to me. That's very gallant, but I think I should like to see how you do it first. James, you've not been looking after the house properly. What have I done, or not done, my love? My own particular pet scrubbing brush has been used for blackleading. A heartbreaking wail bursts from Marchbanks. Burgess looks round, amazed. Candida hurries to the sofa. What's the matter? Are you ill, Eugene? No, not ill. Only horror, horror, horror. He bows his head on his hands. What? Got the horrors, Mr. Marchbanks? Oh, that's bad at your age. 
You must leave it off gradually. Nonsense, Papa. It's only poetic horror, isn't it, Eugene? Oh, poetic horror, is it? I beg your pardon, I'm sure. What is it, Eugene? The scrubbing brush? Well, there, never mind. She sits down beside him. Wouldn't you like to present me with a nice new one, with an ivory back inlaid with mother of pearl? No, not a scrubbing brush, but a boat. A tiny shallop to sail away in, far from the world, where the marble floors are washed by the rain and dried by the sun, where the south wind dusts the beautiful green and purple carpets. Or a chariot, to carry us up into the sky where the lamps are stars, and don't need to be filled with paraffin oil every day. And where there is nothing to do but be idle, selfish, and useless. Oh, James, how could you spoil it all? Yes, to be idle, selfish, and useless. That is to be beautiful and free and happy. Hasn't every man desired that with all his soul for the woman he loves? That's my ideal. What's yours and that of all the dreadful people who live in these hideous rows of houses? Sermons and scrubbing brushes. With you to preach the sermon and your wife to scrub. He cleans the boots, Eugene. You will have to clean them tomorrow for saying that about him. Oh, don't talk about boots. Your feet should be beautiful on the mountains. My feet would not be beautiful on the Hackney Road without boots. Come, Candy, don't be vulgar. Mr. Mortsbank ain't accustomed to it. You're giving him the horrors again. I mean the poetic ones. Morel is silent. Apparently he is busy with his letters. Really he is puzzling with misgiving over this new and alarming experience that the surer he is of his moral thrusts, the more swiftly and effectively Eugene parries them. To find himself beginning to fear a man whom he does not respect affects him bitterly. Miss Garnet comes in with a telegram. Reply paid. The boy's waiting. Maria is ready for you now in the kitchen, Mrs. Morell. Candida rises. The onions have come. Onions? Yes, onions. Not even Spanish ones. Nasty little red onions. You shall help me to slice them. Come along. She catches him by the wrist and runs out, pulling him after her. Burgess rises in consternation and stands aghast on the hearthrug, staring after them. Candy didn't ought to handle a Pierce nevy like that. He's going too full with it. Looky here, James. Do he often get taken queer like that? I don't know. He talks very pretty. I always had a turn for a bit of potery. Candy takes out of me that away. Who's to make me tell her fairy stories when she was only a little kitty, not that I? Indicating a stature of two feet or thereabouts. Ah, indeed. He blots the telegram and goes out. Used you to make the fairy stories up out of your own head? Burgess, not deigning to reply, strikes an attitude of the haughtiest disdain on the hearthrug. I should never have supposed you had it in you. By the way, I'd better warn you, since you've taken such a fancy to Mr. Marchbanks. He's mad. Mad? What? Him too? Mad as a March hare. He did frighten me, I can tell you, just before you came in that time. Haven't you noticed the queer things he says? So that's what the poetic horrors means. Blame me if it didn't come into my head once or twice that he must be off his chump. Well, this is a pretty sort of asylum for a man to be in, with no one but you to take care of him. Yes, what a dreadful thing it would be if anything happened to you. Don't you address no remarks to me? Tell your employer that I've gone into the garden for a smoke. Oh! Before Burgess can retort, Morell comes back. Going for a turn in the garden to smoke, James? Oh, all right, all right. Burgess goes out pathetically in the character of the weary old man. Morell stands at the table, turning over his papers, and adding across to Prosser Peen. Well, Miss Prossy, why have you been calling my father-in-law names? Uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> uh... 
Oh, come, come, come! Never mind, Pross. He is a silly old fathead, isn't he? With an explosive sob, she makes a dash at the door and vanishes, banging it. Morel, shaking his head resignedly, sighs and goes wearily to his chair, where he sits down and sets to work, looking old and careworn. Candida comes in. She has finished her household work and taken off the apron. She at once notices his dejected appearance and posts herself quietly at the spare chair, looking down at him attentively. But she says nothing. Well, where is Eugene? Washing his hands in the scullery under the tap. He will make an excellent cook if he can only get over his dread of Maria. Ha! No doubt. Come here, dear. Let me look at you. He drops his pen and yields himself at her disposal. She makes him rise and brings him a little way from the table, looking at him critically all the time. Turn your face to the light. My boy is not looking well. Has he been overworking? Nothing more than usual. He looks very pale and grey and wrinkled and old. Here, you've done enough writing for today. Leave Prossy to finish it and come and talk to me. But yes, I must be talked to sometimes. Now, she makes him sit down and seats herself on the carpet beside his knee. You're beginning to look better already. Why don't you give up all this tiresome overworking, going out every night lecturing and talking? Of course, what you say is all very true and very right, but it does no good. They don't mind what you say to them one little bit. Of course, they agree with you, but what's the use of people agreeing with you if they go and do just the opposite of what you tell them the moment your back is turned? Look at our congregation at St. Dominic's. Why do they come to hear you talking about Christianity every Sunday? Why, just because they've been so full of business and money making for six days that they want to forget all about it and have a rest on the seventh, so that they can go back fresh and make money harder than ever. You positively help them at it instead of hindering them. You know very well, Candida, that I often blow them up soundly for that. But if there is nothing in their church going but rest and diversion, why don't they try something more amusing, more self-indulgent? There must be some good in the fact that they prefer St. Dominic's to worse places on Sunday. Oh, the worst places aren't open, and even if they were, they daren't be seen going to them. Besides, James, dear, you preach so splendidly that it's as good as a play for them. Why do you think the women are so enthusiastic? Candida. Oh, I know, you silly boy. You think it's your socialism and your religion. But if it was that, they'd do what you tell them instead of only coming to look at you. They all have Prossy's complaint. Prossy's complaint? What do you mean, Candida? Yes, Prossy, and all the other secretaries you ever had. Why does Prossy condescend to wash up the things and to peel potatoes and abase herself in all manner of ways for six shillings a week less than she used to get in a city office? She's in love with you, James. That's the reason. They're all in love with you, and you are in love with preaching because you do it so beautifully, and you think it's all enthusiasm for the kingdom of heaven on earth, and so do they. You dear silly, Candida. What dreadful, what soul-destroying cynicism! Are you jesting? Oh, can it be? Are you jealous? Yes, I feel a little jealous sometimes. What of Prossy? No, 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 no! Not jealous of anybody. Jealous for somebody else who is not loved as he ought to be. Me? You? Why you're spoiled with love and worship? You get far more than is good for you. No. I mean Eugene. Eugene. It seems unfair that all the love should go to you and none to him, although he needs it so much more than you do. A convulsive movement shakes him in spite of himself. What's the matter? Am I worrying you? Not at all. You know that I have perfect confidence in you, Candida. You vain thing! Are you so sure of your irresistible attractions? Candida. You are shocking me. I never thought of my attractions. I thought of your goodness, your purity. That is what I confide in. What a nasty, uncomfortable thing to say to me! 
Oh, you are a clergyman, James, a thorough clergyman. So Eugene says. Eugene's always right. He's a wonderful boy. I have grown fonder and fonder of him all the time I was away. Do you know, James, that though he has not the least suspicion of it himself, he is ready to fall madly in love with me? Oh, he has no suspicion of it himself, hasn't he? Not a bit. Some day he will know when he has grown up and experienced like you, and he will know that I must have known. I wonder what he will think of me then. No evil, Candida. I hope and trust. No evil. That will depend. Depend? Yes. It will depend on what happens to him. Don't you see? It will depend on how he comes to learn what love really is. I mean, on the sort of woman who will teach it to him. Yes, no, I don't know what you mean. If he learns it from a good woman, then it will be all right. He will forgive me. Forgive? But suppose he learns it from a bad woman, as so many men do, especially poetic men who imagine all women are angels. Suppose he only discovers the value of love when he has thrown it away and degraded himself in his ignorance. Will he forgive me then, do you think? Forgive you for what? Don't you understand? He shakes his head. She turns to him again, so as to explain with the fondest intimacy. I mean, will he forgive me for not teaching him myself? For abandoning him to the bad women for the sake of my goodness? My purity, as you call it. Ah, James, how little you understand me, to talk of your confidence in my goodness and purity. I would give them both to poor Eugene as willingly as I would give my shawl to a beggar dying of cold, if there were nothing else to restrain me. Put your trust in my love for you, James, for if that went, I should care very little for your sermons. Mere phrases that you cheat yourself and others with every day. His words. Whose words? Eugene's. He is always right. He understands you. He understands me. He understands Prossy and you, James. You understand nothing. She laughs and kisses him to console him. He recoils as if stung and springs up. How can you bear to do that when? Oh, Candida. I had rather you had plunged a grappling iron into my heart than given me that kiss. My dear, what's the matter? Don't touch me. James! They are interrupted by the entrance of Marchbanks with Burgess, who stops near the door, staring, whilst Eugene hurries forward between them. Is anything the matter? Nothing but this, that either you were right this morning, or Candida is mad. What? Candy mad too? Oh, come, come, come. He crosses the room to the fireplace, protesting as he goes, and knocks the ashes out of his pipe on the bars. Morel sits down desperately, leaning forward to hide his face, and interlacing his fingers rigidly to keep them steady. Oh, you're only shocked. Is that all? How conventional all you unconventional people are. Come, behave yourself, Candy. What will Mr. Morchbank think of you? This comes of James teaching me to think for myself, and never to hold back out of fear of what other people may think of me. It works beautifully as long as I think the same things as he does. But now, because I have just thought something different, look at him. Just look. She points to Morel, greatly amused. Eugene looks and instantly presses his hand on his heart, as if some deadly pain had shot through it, and sits down on the sofa like a man witnessing a tragedy. Well, James, you certainly hate as impressive looking as Oozle. <laughs> I suppose not. I beg all your pardons. I was not conscious of making a fuss. Well, 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 well. He goes back to his place at the table, setting to work at his papers again with resolute cheerfulness. Candida going to the sofa and sitting beside Marchbanks, still in a bantering humour. Well, Eugene, why are you so sad? Did the onions make you cry? Morel cannot prevent himself from watching them. It is your cruelty. I hate cruelty. It is a horrible thing to see one person make another suffer. Poor boy, have I been cruel? 
Did I make it slice nasty little red onions? Oh, stop, stop. I don't mean myself. You have made him suffer frightfully. I feel his pain in my own heart. I know that it is not your fault. It is something that must happen, but don't make light of it. I shudder when you torture him and laugh. I torture James? Nonsense, Eugene. How you exaggerate. Silly. She looks round at Morel, who hastily resumes his writing. She goes to him and stands behind his chair, bending over him. Don't work any more, dear. Come and talk to us. Ah, no. I can't talk. I can only preach. Well, come and preach. Oh, no, Candy. Hang it all. Lexi Mill comes in, looking anxious and important. Lexi hastening to shake hands with Candida. How do you do, Mrs. Morell? So glad to see you back again. Thank you, Lexi. You know Eugene, don't you? Oh, yes. How do you do, Marchbanks? Quite well, thanks. I've just come from the Guild of St. Matthew. They are in the greatest consternation about your telegram. There's nothing wrong, is there? What did you telegraph about, James? He was to have spoken for them to-night. They've taken the large hall in Mare Street, and spent a lot of money on posters. Morell's telegram was to say he couldn't come. It came on them like a thunderbolt. Given up an engagement to speak. First time in his life, I'll bet. I eat candy. They decided to send an urgent telegram to you, asking whether you could not change your mind. Have you received it? Yes, yes, I got it. It was reply paid. Yes, I know. I answered it. I can't go. But why, James? Because I don't choose. These people forget that I am a man. They think I am a talking machine to be turned on for their pleasure every evening of my life. May I not have one night at home with my wife and my friends? They are all amazed at this outburst, except Eugene. His expression remains unchanged. Oh, James, you know you'll have an attack of bad conscience tomorrow, and I shall have to suffer for that. I know, of course, that they make the most unreasonable demands on you, but they have been telegraphing all over the place for another speaker, and they can get nobody but the president of the agnostic league. Well, an excellent man. What better do they want? But he always insists so powerfully on the divorce of socialism from Christianity. He will undo all the good we have been doing. Of course, you know best, but... Oh, do go, James. We'll all go. Look here, Candy. I say, let's stay at home by the fire, comfortable. He won't need to be more than a couple of air away. He'll be just as comfortable at the meeting. We'll all sit on the platform and be great people. Oh, please don't let us go on the platform. No, everyone will stare at us. I, I, I couldn't. I'll sit at the back of the room. Don't be afraid. They'll be too busy looking at James to notice you. Prossy's complaint, Candida, eh? Yes. Prossy's complaint? What are you talking about, James? Miss Garnet? Yes, Mr. Morell. Coming. They all wait, except Burgess, who goes stealthily to Lexi and draws him aside. Listen here, Mr. Mill. What's Prossy complaint? What's wrong with her? Well, I don't exactly know, but she spoke very strangely to me this morning. I'm afraid she's a little out of her mind sometimes. Why, it must be catching. Four in the same house. He goes back to the hearth, quite lost before the instability of the human intellect in a clergyman's house. What is it, Mr. Morell? Telegraph to the Guild of St. Matthew that I am coming. Don't they expect you? Do as I tell you. Proserpine, frightened, sits down at her typewriter and obeys. 
Morel goes across to Burgess, Candida watching his movements all the time with growing wonder and misgiving. Burgess, you don't want to come? Oh, don't put it like that, James. It's only that it ain't Sunday, you know. I'm sorry, I thought you might like to be introduced to the chairman. He's on the works committee of the county council and has some influence in the matter of contracts. Burgess wakes up at once. Morel, expecting as much, waits a moment. Will you come? Of course I'll come, James. Ain't it always a pleasure to hear you? I shall want you to take some notes at the meeting, Miss Garnet, if you have no other engagement. She nods, afraid to speak. You are coming, Lexi, I suppose? Certainly. We are all coming, James. No, you are not coming, and Eugene is not coming. You will stay here and entertain him to celebrate your return home. Eugene rises, breathless. But James... I insist. You do not want to come, and he does not want to come. Candida is about to protest. Oh, don't concern yourselves. I shall have plenty of people without you. Your chairs will be wanted by unconverted people who have never heard me before. Eugene, wouldn't you like to come? I should be afraid to let myself go before Eugene. He is so critical of sermons. He knows I am afraid of him. He told me as much this morning. Well, I shall show him how much afraid I am by leaving him here in your custody, Candida. That's brave. That's beautiful. He sits down again, listening with parted lips. But, but is anything the matter, James? I can't understand. Ah, I thought it was I who couldn't understand, dear. He takes her tenderly in his arms and kisses her on the forehead, then looks round quietly. Act Three of Candida. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Candida by George Bernard Shaw. Act Three. Late in the evening, past ten. The curtains are drawn and the lamps lighted. The typewriter is in its case. The large table has been cleared and tidied. Everything indicates that the day's work is done. Candida and Marchbanks are seated at the fire. The reading lamp is on the mantel-shelf above Marchbanks, who is sitting on the small chair reading aloud from a manuscript. A little pile of manuscripts and a couple of volumes of poetry are on the carpet beside him. Candida is in the easy chair with the poker, a light brass one, upright in her hand. She is leaning back and looking at the point of it curiously, with her feet stretched towards the blaze and her heels resting on the fender, profoundly unconscious of her appearance and surroundings. Every poet that has ever lived has put that thought into a sonnet. He must, he can't help it. Haven't you been listening? Mrs. Morell? Eh? Haven't you been listening? Oh, yes, it's very nice. Go on, Eugene. I'm longing to hear what happens to the angel. I beg your pardon for boring you. But you are not boring me, I assure you. Please go on. Do, Eugene. I finished the poem about the angel a quarter of an hour ago. I've read you several things since. I'm so sorry, Eugene. I think the poker must have fascinated me. She puts it down. Made me horribly uneasy. Why didn't you tell me? I'd have put it down at once. I was afraid of making you uneasy, too. It looked as if it were a weapon. If I were a hero of old, I should have laid my drawn sword between us. If Morel had come in, he would have thought you had taken up the poker because there was no sword between us. What? I can't quite follow that. Those sonnets of yours have perfectly addled me. Why should there be a sword between us? Oh, never mind. He stoops to pick up the manuscript. Put that down again, Eugene. There are limits to my appetite for poetry. Even your poetry. You've been reading to me for more than two hours. Ever since James went out, I want to talk. Uh, no, I, I mustn't talk. I think I'll go out and take a walk in the park. Making for the door. 
Nonsense, it's shut long ago. Come and sit down on the hearth rug and talk moonshine as you usually do. I want to be amused. Don't you want to? Yes. Then come along. She moves her chair back a little to make room. He hesitates, then timidly stretches himself on the hearth rug, face upwards, and throws back his head across her knees, looking up at her. I have been so miserable all the evening because I was doing right. Now I'm doing wrong, and I'm happy. Yes, I'm sure you feel a great grown-up wicked deceiver. Quite proud of yourself, aren't you? Take care. I'm ever so much older than you, if only you knew. He turns quite over on his knees, with his hands clasped and his arms on her lap, and speaks with growing impulse, his blood beginning to stir. May I say some wicked things to you? No, but you must say anything you really and truly feel. Anything at all, no matter what it is. I am not afraid, so long as it is your real self that speaks and not a mere attitude. A gallant attitude, or a wicked attitude, or even a poetic attitude. I put you on your honour and truth. Now, say whatever you want to. Oh, now I can't say anything. All the words I know belong to some attitude or other. All except one. What one is that? Candida. Candida, 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 candida. I must say that now, because you've put me on my honour and truth. And I never think or feel Mrs. Morell. It is always candida. Of course. And what have you to say to candida? Nothing but to repeat your name a thousand times. Don't you feel that every time is a prayer to you? Doesn't it make you happy to be able to pray? Yes, very happy. Well, that happiness is the answer to your prayer. Do you want anything more? No. I have come into heaven, where want is unknown. Morel comes in. He halts on the threshold and takes in the scene at a glance. I hope I don't disturb you. Candida starts up violently, but without the smallest embarrassment, laughing at herself. Eugene, still kneeling, saves himself from falling by putting his hands on the seat of the chair, and remains there, staring open-mouthed at Morel. "'Oh, James, how you startled me! I was so taken up with Eugene that I didn't hear your latch-key. How did the meeting go off? Did you speak well?' "'I have never spoken better in my life.' "'That was first-rate.' How much was the collection? I forgot to ask. He must have spoken splendidly, or he would never have forgotten that. Where are all the others? They left long before I could get away. I thought I should never escape. I believe they are having supper somewhere. Oh, in that case, Maria may go to bed. I'll tell her. She goes out to the kitchen. Well? Well? Have you anything to tell me? Only that I have been making a fool of myself here in private, whilst you have been making a fool of yourself in public. Hardly in the same way, I think. The very, very, very same way. I've been playing the good man, just like you. When you began your heroics about leaving me here with Candida... Candida? Oh, yes, I've got that far. Heroics are infectious. I caught the disease from you. I swore not to say a word in your absence that I would not have said a month ago in your presence. Did you keep your oath? I was an ass enough to keep it up until about ten minutes ago. Up to that moment I went on desperately reading to her. Reading my own poems, anybody's poems, to stave off a conversation. I was standing outside the gate of heaven and refusing to go in. Oh, you can't think how heroic it was, and how uncomfortable. Then... Then? Then she couldn't bear being read to any longer. And you approached the gate of heaven at last? Yes. Well? Speak, man. Have you no feeling for me? Then she became an angel, and there was a flaming sword that turned every way so that I couldn't go in. For I saw that the gate was really the gate of hell. She repulsed you. No, you fool. If she had done that, I should never have seen that I was in heaven already. Repulsed me? You think that would have saved me? Virtuous indignation? Oh, you are not worthy to live in the same world with her. He turns away contemptuously to the other side of the room. Do you think you made yourself more worthy by reviling me, Eugene? Here endeth the first lesson. Well, I don't think much of your preaching after all. 
I believe I could do it better myself. The man I want to meet is the man that Candida married. The man that... Do you mean me? I, I don't mean the Reverend James Maver Morell, moralist and windbag. I, I mean the real man that the Reverend James must have hidden somewhere inside his black coat. The man that Candida loved. You can't make a woman like Candida love you by merely buttoning your collar at the back instead of in front. When Candida promised to marry me, I was the same moralist and windbag that you now see. I wore my black coat, and my collar was buttoned behind instead of in front. Do you think she would have loved me any the better for being insincere in my profession? Oh, she forgave you, just as she forgives me for being a coward and a weakling and what you call a snivelling little whelp and all the rest of it. A, w a woman like that has d divine insight. She loves our souls and not our follies and vanities and illusions, or our collars and coats, or any other of the rags and tatters we are rolled up in. What I want to know is how you got past the flaming sword that stopped me. Perhaps because I was not interrupted at the end of ten minutes. What? Man can climb to the highest summits, but he cannot dwell there long. It's false. There can he dwell forever and there only. It's in the other moments that he can find no rest, no sense of the silent glory of life. Where would you have me spend my moments if not on the summits? In the scullery, slicing onions and filling lamps. Or in the pulpit, scrubbing cheap earthenware souls? Yes, that too. It was there that I earned my golden moment, and the right, in that moment, to ask her to love me. I did not take the moment on credit, nor did I use it to steal another man's happiness. I have no doubt you conducted the transaction as honestly as if you were buying a pound of cheese. I could only go to her as a beggar. A beggar dying of cold, asking for her shawl? <laughs> Thank you for touching up my poetry. Yes, if you like, a beggar dying of cold, asking for her shawl. And she refused. Shall I tell you why she refused? I can tell you, on her own authority, it was because of... She didn't refuse. Not? She offered me all I chose to ask for. Her shawl, her wings, the wreath of stars on her head, the lilies in her hand, the crescent moon beneath her feet. Out with the truth, man. My wife is my wife. I want no more of your poetic fripperies. I know well that if I have lost her love and you have gained it, no law will bind her. Catch me by this shirt, Colonel Morel. She will arrange it for me afterwards as she did this morning. I shall feel her hands touch me. You young imp. Do you know how dangerous it is to say that to me? Or has something made you brave? I'm not afraid now. I disliked you before. That was why I shrank from your touch, but I saw today, when she tortured you, that you love her. Since then I've been your friend. You may strangle me if you like. Eugene, if that is not a heartless lie, if you have a spark of human feeling left in you, will you tell me what has happened during my absence? What happened? Why, the flaming sword. Well, in plain prose, I loved her so exquisitely that I wanted nothing more than the happiness of being in such love. And before I had time to come down from the highest summits, you came in. So it is still unsettled, still the misery of doubt. Misery! I am the happiest of men. I desire nothing now but her happiness. Oh, Morel, let us both give her up. Why should she have to choose between a wretched little nervous disease like me and a pig-headed parson like you? Let us go on a pilgrimage, you to the east and I to the west, in search of a worthy lover for her. Some beautiful archangel with purple wings. Some fiddlestick. Oh, if she is mad enough to leave me for you, who will protect her? Who will help her? Who will work for her? Who will be a father to her children? He sits down distractedly on the sofa, with his elbows on his knees and his head propped on his clenched fists. She does not ask those silly questions. It is she who wants somebody to protect, 
to help to work for, somebody to give her children to protect to help and to work for, some grown-up man who has become as a little child again. Oh, you fool, you fool, you triple fool! I am the man, Morel, I am the man! You don't understand what a woman is! Send for her, Morel, send for her, and let her choose between... The door opens and Candida enters. He stops as if petrified. What on earth are you at, Eugene? Uh, James and I are having a preaching match, and he is getting the worst of it. Candida looks quickly round at Morel. Seeing that he is distressed, she hurries down to him, greatly vexed, speaking with vigorous reproach to Marchbanks. You have been annoying him. Now I won't have it, Eugene, do you hear? My boy shall not be worried. I will protect him. Protect? What have you been saying? Nothing. Eugene, nothing. I mean, I'm very sorry. I won't do it again. Indeed I won't. I'll let him alone. Let me alone? You young... Shh, no. Let me deal with him, James. Oh, you're not angry with me, are you? Yes, I am. Very angry. I have a great mind to pack you out of the house. Gently, Candida. Gently. I am able to take care of myself. Yes, dear, of course you are. But you mustn't be annoyed and made miserable. I'll go. Oh, you needn't go. I can't turn you out at this time of night. Shame on you, for shame. But what have I done? I know what you have done, as well as if I had been here all the time. Oh, it was unworthy. You are like a child. You cannot hold your tongue. I would die ten times over sooner than give you a moment's pain. Much good your dying would do me. Candida, my dear, this altercation is hardly quite seemingly. It is a matter between two men, and I am the right person to settle it. Two men? Do you call that a man? You bad boy. If I am to be scolded like this, I must make a boy's excuse. He began it, and he's bigger than I am. That can't be true. You didn't begin it, James, did you? No. Oh. You began it, this morning. But your other point is true. I am certainly the bigger of the two, and, I hope, the stronger candida. So you had better leave the matter in my hands. Yes, dear, but... I don't understand about this morning. You need not understand, my dear. But, James, I... The street bell rings. Oh, bother, here they all come. She goes out to let them in. Oh, Morel, isn't it dreadful? She's angry with us. She hates me. What shall I do? Eugene, my head is spinning round. I shall begin to laugh presently. No, no, she'll think I've thrown you into hysterics. Don't laugh. Boisterous voices and laughter are heard approaching. Lexi Mill, his eyes sparkling and his bearing denoting unwonted elevation of spirit, enters with Burgess, who is greasy and self-complacent, but has all his wits about him. Miss Garnet, with her smartest hat and jacket on, follows them, but though her eyes are brighter than before, she is evidently a prey to misgiving. She places herself with her back to her typewriting table, with one hand on it to rest herself, passes the other across her forehead as if she were a little tired and giddy. Marchbanks relapses into shyness and edges away into the corner near the window, where Morel's books are. Morel, I must congratulate you. What a noble, splendid, inspired address you gave us! You surpassed yourself! So you did, James. It fair kept me awake to the last word, didn't it, Miss Garnet? Oh, I wasn't minding you. I was trying to make notes. She takes out her notebook and looks at her stenography, which nearly makes her cry. Did I go too fast, Pross? <sighs> Much too fast. You know I can't do more than a hundred words a minute. She relieves her feelings by throwing her notebook angrily beside her machine, ready for use next morning. Oh, well, well, never mind, never mind, never mind. Have you all had supper? Mr. Burgess has been kind enough to give us a really splendid supper at the Belgrave. Don't mention it, Mr. Mill. You're hearty welcome to my little treat. We had champagne. I never tasted it before. I feel quite giddy. A champagne supper? 
That was very handsome. Was it my eloquence that produced all this extravagance? Your eloquence and Mr. Burgess's goodness of heart. And what a very fine fellow the chairman is, Morel. He came to supper with us. Oh, the chairman. Now I understand. Burgess, covering a lively satisfaction in his diplomatic cunning with a deprecatory cough, retires to the hearth. Lexy folds his arms and leans against the cellaret in a high-spirited attitude. Candida comes in with glasses, lemons, and a jug of hot water on a tray. Who will have some lemonade? You know our rules. Total abstinence. She puts the tray on the table and takes up the lemon squeezers, looking inquiringly round at them. No use, dear. They've all had champagne. Pross has broken her pledge. You don't mean to say you've been drinking champagne. Yes, I do. I'm only a beer teetotaler, not a champagne teetotaler. I don't like beer. Are there any letters for me to answer, Mr. Morell? No more tonight. Very well. Good night, everybody. Had I not better see you home, Miss Garnet? No, thank you. I shan't trust myself with anybody tonight. I wish I hadn't taken any of that stuff. She walks straight out. Stuff indeed. That girl don't know what champagne is. Pomery and Greeno at twelve and six a bottle. She took two glasses a most straight hoof. Go and look after her, Lexy. But if she should really be... Suppose she began to sing in the street, or anything of that sort. Just so, she may. That's why you'd better see her safely home. Do, Lexy, there's a good fellow. She shakes his hand and pushes him gently to the door. It's evidently my duty to go. I hope it may not be necessary. Good night, Mrs. Morell. Good night. He goes. Candida shuts the door. He was gushing with extra piety himself out of two sips. People can't drink like they used to. Well, James, it's time to lock up. Mr. Morchbanks, shall I have the pleasure of your company for a bit of the way home? Y yes, I'd better go. He hurries across to the door, but Candida places herself before it, barring his way. You sit down. You're not going yet. No, I... I, I didn't mean to. He comes back into the room and sits down abjectly on the sofa. Mr. Marchbanks will stay the night with us, Papa. Oh, well, I'll say good night. So long, James. He shakes hands with Morel and goes on to Eugene. Make em give you a night light by your bed, Mr. Morchbanks. It will comfort you if you wake up in the night with a touch of that complaint of yours. Good night. Thank you. I will. Good night, Mr. Burgess. They shake hands and Burgess goes to the door. Stay here, dear. I'll put on Papa's coat for him. She goes out with Burgess. Morel, there's going to be a terrible scene, aren't you afraid? Not in the least. I never envied you your courage before. Stand by me, won't you? Each for himself, Eugene. She must choose between us now. He goes to the other side of the room as Candida returns. Eugene sits down again on the sofa like a guilty schoolboy on his best behavior. Are you sorry? Yes, heartbroken. Well, then, you are forgiven. Now go off to bed like a good little boy. I want to talk to James about you. I can't do that, Morel. I must be here. I'll not go away. Tell her. Tell me what? I have nothing to tell her, except that she is my greatest treasure on earth, if she is really mine. Candida, offended by his yielding to his orator's instinct and treating her as if she were the audience at the Guild of St. Matthew. I am sure Eugene can say no less, if that is all. Morel, she's laughing at us. There is nothing to laugh at. Are you laughing at us, Candida? Eugene is very quick-witted, James. I hope I am going to laugh, but I am not sure that I am not going to be very angry. She goes to the fireplace and stands there, leaning with her arms on the mantelpiece and her foot on the fender, whilst Eugene steals to Morel and plucks him by the sleeve. Stop, Morel! Don't let us say anything! 
Morel pushing Eugene away without deigning to look at him. I hope you don't mean that as a threat, Candida. Take care, James. Eugene, I asked you to go. Are you going? He shall not go. I wish him to remain. I'll go. I'll do whatever you want. He turns to the door. Stop. He obeys. Didn't you hear James say he wished you to stay? James is master here, don't you know that? By what right is he master? Tell him, James. My dear, I don't know of any right that makes me master. I assert no such right. You don't know? Oh, James, James. I wonder, do you understand, Eugene? No, you're too young. Well, I give you leave to stay, to stay and learn. She comes away from the hearth and places herself between them. Now, James, what's the matter? Come, tell me. Don't! Come, out with it. I meant to prepare your mind carefully, Candida, so as to prevent misunderstanding. Yes, dear, I am sure you did. But never mind. I shan't misunderstand. Well, uh... Well? Eugene declares that you are in love with him. No, 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 never! I did not, Mrs. Morrell. It's not true. I said I loved you and that he didn't. I said that I understood you and that he couldn't. And it was not after what passed there before the fire that I spoke. It was not on my word. It was this morning. This morning? Yes. That was what the matter was with my collar. His collar? Oh, James, did you? You know, Candida, that I have a temper to struggle with. And he said that you despised me in your heart. Did you say that? No. Then James has just told me a falsehood. Is that what you mean? No, no, no I, I... It was David's wife, and it wasn't at home. It was when she saw him dancing before all the people. Dancing before all the people, Candida, and thinking that he was moving their hearts by his mission when they were only suffering from Prossy's complaint. Don't try to look indignant, Candida. Try. Eugene was right. As you told me a few hours after, he is always right. He said nothing that you did not say far better yourself. He is the poet who sees everything, and I am the poor parson who understands nothing. Do you mind what is said by a foolish boy because I said something like it again in jest? That foolish boy can speak with the inspiration of a child and the cunning of a serpent. He has claimed that you belong to him and not to me, and, rightly or wrongly, I have come to fear that it may be true. I will not go about tortured with doubts and suspicions. I will not live with you and keep a secret from you. I will not suffer the intolerable degradation of jealousy. We have agreed, he and I, that you shall choose between us now. I await your decision. Oh, I am to choose, am I? I suppose it is quite settled that I must belong to one or the other. Quite. You must choose, definitely. Well, no, you, you don't understand. She means that she belongs to herself. I mean that, and a good deal more, Master Eugene, as you will both find out presently. And pray, my lords and masters, what have you to offer for my choice? I am up for auction, it seems. What do you bid, James? Canned. I can't speak. Candida impulsively going to him. Ah, dearest. Stop! It's not fair! You mustn't show her that you suffer, Morel. I'm on the rack too, but I'm not crying. Yes, you are right. It is not for pity that I am bidding. He disengages himself from Candida. I beg your pardon, James. I did not mean to touch you. I am waiting to hear your bid. I have nothing to offer you but my strength for your defence, my honesty of purpose for your surety, my ability and industry for your livelihood, and my authority and position for your dignity. That is all it becomes a man to offer to a woman. And you, Eugene, what do you offer? My weakness, my desolation, my heart's need! That's a good bid, Eugene. Now I know how to make my choice. She pauses and looks curiously from one to the other, as if weighing them. Morel, whose lofty confidence has changed into heartbreaking dread at Eugene's bid, loses all power of concealing his anxiety. 
Eugene, strung to the highest tension, does not move a muscle. Candida! Coward! I give myself to the weaker of the two. Eugene divines her meaning at once. His face whitens like steel in a furnace that cannot melt it. I accept your sentence, Candida. Do you understand, Eugene? Oh, I feel I'm lost. He cannot bear the burden. Do you mean me, Candida? Let us sit and talk comfortably over it like three friends. Sit down, dear. Morel takes the chair from the fireside, the children's chair. Bring me that chair, Eugene. She indicates the easy chair. He fetches it silently, even with something like cold strength, and places it next Morel, a little behind him. She sits down. He goes to the sofa and sits there, still silent and inscrutable. When they are all settled, she begins, throwing a spell of quietness on them by her calm, sane, tender tone. You remember what you told me about yourself, Eugene? How nobody has cared for you since your old nurse died? How those clever, fashionable sisters and successful brothers of yours were your mother's and father's pets? How miserable you were at Eton? How your father is trying to starve you into returning to Oxford? How you have had to live without comfort or welcome or refuge? Always lonely and nearly always disliked and misunderstood, poor boy. I had my books, and I had nature, and at last I met you. Never mind that just at present. Now I want you to look at this other boy here. My boy, spoiled from his cradle. We go once a fortnight to see his parents. You should come with us, Eugene, and see the pictures of the hero of that household. James is a baby, the most wonderful of all babies. James holding his first school prize won at the ripe age of eight. James is the captain of his eleven. James in his first frock coat. James under all sorts of glorious circumstances. You know how strong he is. I hope he didn't hurt you. How clever he is, how happy. Ask James's mother and his three sisters what it cost to save James the trouble of doing anything but be strong and clever and happy. Ask me what it cost to be James's mother and three sisters and wife and mother to his children all in one. Ask Prossy and Maria how troublesome the house is, even when we have no visitors to help us to slice the onions. Ask the tradesmen who want to worry James and spoil his beautiful sermons who it is that puts them off. When there is money to give, he gives it. When there is money to refuse, I refuse it. I build a castle of comfort and indulgence and love for him, and stand sentinel always to keep little vulgar cares out. I make him master here, though he does not know it, and could not tell you a moment ago how it came to be so. And when he thought I might go away with you— his only anxiety was what should become of me. And to tempt me to stay he offered me, his strength for my defence, his industry for my livelihood, his position for my dignity, his— Ah, I am mixing up your beautiful sentences and spoiling them, am I not, darling? She lays her cheek fondly against his. Morel, quite overcome— kneeling beside her chair and embracing her with boyish ingenuousness. It's all true. Every word. What I am you have made me with the labour of your hands and the love of your heart. You are my wife, my mother, my sisters. You are the sum of all loving care to me. Am I your mother and sisters to you, Eugene? Ah, never out then into the night with me. You are not going like that, Eugene. I know the hour when it strikes. I am impatient to do what must be done. Candida, don't let him do anything rash. Oh, there is no fear. He has learnt to live without happiness. I no longer desire happiness. Life is nobler than that. Parson James, I give you my happiness with both hands. I love you because you have filled the heart of the woman I loved. Goodbye. He goes towards the door. One last word. How old are you, Eugene? As old as the world now. This morning I was eighteen. Candida, going to him, and standing behind him with one hand caressingly on his shoulder. Eighteen. Will you, for my sake, make a little poem out of the two sentences I am going to say to you? 
And will you promise to repeat it to yourself whenever you think of me? Say the sentences. When I am thirty, she will be forty-five. When I am sixty, she will be seventy-five. In a hundred years, we shall be the same age. But I have a better secret than that in my heart. Let me go now. The night outside grows impatient. Goodbye. She takes his face in her hands, and as he divines her intention and bends his knee, she kisses his forehead. Then he flies out into the night. She turns to Morel, holding out her arms to him. Ah, uh, James! They embrace, but they do not know the secret in the poet's heart. End of Act Three